guys, Matt Grandy with Dyco Welding out of Harrisburg, PA. How's everyone doing today? What I want to do today is take a minute and talk to you guys about cast iron welding. Being in sales, there are a lot of different questions that come up in weld shops, especially maintenance and repair shops or maintenance and repair welding shops on how to repair cast iron. What's the best way to tackle it? Um, and there's a lot of different answers depending on the application. Things that uh, can have a determination on which process you choose. Uh, the big thing is the size of the part. Is the part, you know, something that you can fix on your weld bench, take apart, you know, have the part sitting there like a, a pump housing, a small pump housing, or is it an engine block that needs, uh, that can't get pulled out of a tractor trailer truck or a semi truck um, and needs to re be repaired in the tractor or in the truck. So depending on the application, just know that there's different ways of repairing cast iron depending on the size of the part. And that's basically due to uh, being able to heat the part or not being able to heat the part. So uh, what we're gonna do is go over a couple different processes and a couple different ways of doing both. Uh, show you guys some pictures of different applications that we've done and then uh, talk about the, the products that I can offer, or Dyco can offer you uh, to actually do these repairs, whether it's stick welding, MIG welding, TIG welding, brazing, or using spray powders. Those are the real five, uh, five main ones. So let's get started. First, I want to talk about base metal prep. Um, whether you're welding something hot or welding cast iron hot, repairing it hot, or whether you're welding it cold, uh, preparation is relatively the same with both. You can weld it hot, you can weld it cold. You would weld it hot if you can typically do the part out of service on your bench in a repair shop where you actually have the part where it's broken down. Cold welding is uh, used typically if the part's in service uh, and you can't preheat it. So starting off hot, the idea behind that is you want to preheat the part. I know if you guys have welded cast iron, most guys will tell you you want to get it hot. Um, we like to keep it around 800 degrees Fahrenheit when we're welding it. Uh, welding it cold, you don't want to keep it cold to the touch, but if you weld something cold and cast iron and trying to fix it, you want to keep the temperature down. Uh, and what I mean by down is doing little one to two inch beads at a time, and you can put your hand on it. Once it cools, that you can keep your hand on it. That's cool enough to put another little one or two inch stringer bead on it. Um, so getting into the hot, the hot aspect of it. I say you have a cast iron pump housing that has a crack in it here. What you're going to do, you're going to take that crack, you're going to find the ends of it. Typically I like to uh, grind the crack, just the, the surface of it, shine up that metal so you can expose the, whole, the entire crack. All right. Try to find the ends of the crack, all right? Ideally, what you like to do is center punch the ends of those cracks, drill it out so the crack doesn't continue to grow, um, then take a grinding wheel or a carbide burr bit and start grooving the crack out. Ideally, you wanna get 100% penetration, so you wanna to get to the bottom of that crack. Now, the shape of your grind, or the shape of the metal that you're taking out should be in a U shape. So just keep that in mind. So crack preparation, 100%, and you want a U groove at the bottom, not a V, all right? And what you're gonna do is, um, what I like to do if possible, and you can get that 100% penetration, uh, depending on how thick your cast is, I like to groove it out with a grinder or a burr, a round burr bit, or a domed headed burr bit, carbide burr bit with a die grinder. And at the bottom, follow that crack with a thin, like 1 16th inch cutting wheel and dive in the whole way across that. I know it's not always possible because you can't reach down in there all the time, but that'll give you the 100% breakthrough. So when you're going down there and putting your initial root pass in, you know you're blowing through and getting 100% penetration. So you're going to stack the beads, um, starting at the bottom and then start splitting them 50-50. Whether you're hot welding this or cold welding it, it's a good idea to peen your weld. 
the idea of peening is uh, a weld, as it's molten, is expanded. Anything that's hot is, is, is expanded. Uh, so as, you're, as it cools, think of it as a tightened up muscle. It contracts, it, it pulls in, and it's actually pulling metal, the cast iron, that has uh, up to 5% carbon content. It's actually pulling that towards each other. As it pulls, carbon's very brittle, um, and it won't flex. It won't flex much at all. So as it flexes or it tries to flex, it usually pops, and it usually pops right beside the weld. So by peening a weld, you actually take, take the, uh, the tension out of that weld. You actually stop it from pulling. So that's a good rule of thumb, whether it's hot or cold welded. But uh, hot welded, you're going to do your U-groove prep. You're going to have it all clean, no oils, no contaminants if possible. And you're going to start, uh, start welding. I'd even keep them, keep them beads three, four inches, even if it's hot and have a needle scaler there and peen the crap out of it so it disforms the weld. You can even have a buddy there with a needle scaler and uh, hitting it as soon as you lift off that arc, hitting it with the needle scaler while it's still glowing red and deforming it. Try not to beat on the base metal too much, uh, but you can deform the weld. So that's what you want to do. Getting into preheats um, and the reason, I feel like I need to talk to you about why you preheat. Um, you know, was talking earlier about welding something cold and welding something hot. Uh, but the reason in theory, simple terms, uh, on why you want to preheat cast iron is, I mentioned earlier earlier that cast iron can be up to 5% carbon. You guys that are around weld shops, in weld shops, are a welder, uh, know or are probably familiar with a carbon arc rod, or an air arc rod, uh, or a piece of graphite, as a matter of fact. You know how brittle that is? It'll snap in a heartbeat. You can snap a, you know, a 3 8 inch rod off like, like nothing. It's very brittle. So keep that in mind. That cast iron part you're welding is made up of 5% of that, okay? So the other thing I tell people is cast up, or carbon, I'm sorry, carbon likes heat. So if you don't preheat something, all right, you're welding it cold, you're laying a stringer bead down across, I, if carbon likes heat, it gravitates to it, is what I tell people. So it typically, think of all this carbon running to the, to the edge of your weld, to, to right to your heat affected zone, right beside where you welded. Um, and you guys that have welded cast iron in the past, you know darn well that when it cracks, where does it crack? It cracks right beside the weld, right where all the carbon ran to. So by preheating a part, in simple terms, I tell people, it keeps the carbon happy. It keeps the carbon away from your weld deposit because it's already warm. Now, you're still gonna have a heat affected zone and some uh, carbon embrittlement beside your weld, but it's gonna limit that. So that's the reason behind preheating. Same thing goes for welding something cold. You wanna keep it cool uh, and run short stringer beads because if you don't build up a lot of heat, you're not going to have a lot of carbon gravitating to your heat affected zone. Um, and along with peening it uh, and, and keeping it from pulling, you have a lot better success rate of welding cast iron. So that's the reason behind preheating, um, not preheating, and peening. So uh, keep that food for thought. Alright, another quick thing that you need to know when you're repairing cast iron or what you think might be cast iron is determining whether it is cast iron. A lot of guys get cast iron and cast steel confused. Cast iron is typically 5% carbon, so it uh, has a higher carbon content, there's more carbon in it. Uh, cast steel is typically around 0.5% carbon, uh, which makes it a lot less, a lot less brittle. Um, or cast steel is about 0.5% carbon, which makes it a lot less brittle. Cast iron is about 5% can be up to 5%. So uh, there's a lot of different ways of determining what's what, but um, the things that I typically look for, say I, I think this is a piece of cast steel or cast iron, whatever I might be. To determine whether it's cast iron or cast steel, what you can do is take a, a good sharp chisel, you can run, get a hammer, try to get a curly cue running on the edge of that. Try to get it to roll. 
and curly Q up. If it curls, and you can get it to continue to curl and get a curl started, typically it's cast steel because of the lesser carbon content. If it just keeps crumbling off um, and breaking off and you can't get anything started, it's a good sign that it's cast iron because it's more brittle, has a higher carbon content. Um, so that's the chisel test. The other thing is you can use a four and a half inch grinder with a sanding disc or a flap wheel or, or whatever, but uh, literally get a, get a good spot shined up here. So it's shined up like a shiny piece of metal. And this is called the smudge test. Literally take your thumb for a good 30 seconds, push good and hard on that after it's shined up. Take a look at your finger. This is a little rusty right now because I didn't clean the part up, but um, see if it comes off black. If your thumb comes off black, it's telling you there's more carbon in it than there is, or, or, or more carbon in it than, than a, a cast steel would have. So if it comes off black, you're pulling carbon out of it, and the carbon content's higher, which is pointing towards cast iron, not cast steel. Um, hit it with a grinder. Uh, I'll show a slide here of different uh, grinding sparks. can see cast steel grinds like a steel workbench or a piece of steel. It'll throw a, a longer, brighter orange spark. Uh, whereas you hit cast iron, it's typically a shorter, shorter uh, run of sparks and they're more of a dark orange or red. So those are the three things uh, to look for. There's also, if you've been around it enough, if you hit it with a grinder, you can typically smell cast iron. It has a different smell right, to now it. Now it's time to talk about the products that I suggest using, I sell, uh, for repairing cast iron. There's a few different ways or methods that, that we typically repair cast iron, whether it's a crack or re rebuilding an ear that broke off or, or, or whatnot. But the first off, and I think the most common one out there, is stick, stick electrodes or stick welding it. Uh, most guys will repair cast iron with a stick rod. It'll be probably their first attempt just because the versatility of it. Um, most every shop has a, a basic stick welder, whether it's an AC or DC machine. Um, our product is called Supercast. It's a highly effective cast iron nickel rod. Um, nickel contents somewhere in the mid 50s. Uh, tensile strengths in the 70,000 PSI tensile uh, range, and which means the tensile strength of your weld deposit is higher uh, than the tensile strength of your actual base metal you're welding, cast iron. Uh, so if you follow the steps, use a, a good stick electrode that has good elongation, good tensile strengths, the right amount of nickel. Typically, you have a pretty good success with it. Um, stick welding, you know, it's, it's tough to beat because it's fast, it's relatively inexpensive because you don't need any extra equipment besides a stick welder and a peony hammer. Um, and you, if you do it right and have your weld prepped right and your preheats right, or if you're welding it cold and do it right and you're patient with it, you're going to have a good success rate. Eventually so I'm going to do weld. a video on this torch, show you guys some weld deposits, show it can be drilled, it stays soft because you're not mixing your, your, your base metal into your puddle. So it's machinable after you're done. Um, this torch ain't just good for cast iron either. We'll get into other applications. You can spray uh, chrome carbide, tungsten carbide powders with this thing and put uh, hard facing or uh, you know, wear resistant powders on parts. So uh, those are two of the products. We have a, a wire called M560, which is a flux core nickel wire. Uh, we also have solid wires that are nickel. Uh, our M550 is a 55% nickel and our M990 is a 99% nickel wire. Both, uh, both really good wires depending on what you need. Uh, we have the, the product for your application. So if you want to check us out, you can check us out on Facebook here. You can check us out on our webpage at www.dicoinc.com. 
or you can hit me up. My email will be uh, at the end of the video. So thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys watching, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you learned something. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.